Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Secret Resume Podcast, hosted by me, Melody Moore. In this podcast, we explore the people, places, and experiences that have shaped my guests, those which have influenced who they are as people and where they are in their work life today. You can listen in as we have a rich exploration of often unexamined and undiscussed, but very important aspects of their lives, or as I like to call it, their secret resume. My guest today is Carice Anderson. Carice is a global learning and organisational development leader who has many years of experience in developing human capital strategies and programmes across a broad range of industry sectors. She is also the author of the fantastic book Intelligence Isn't Enough, a black professional's guide to thriving in the workplace. So, Carice Anderson, really, really happy and excited to be talking to you this on this very sunny, uh, beautiful Friday afternoon or sunny and beautiful here in the UK, but you are in the US. Um, so, Carice, why don't you tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do? So, first of all, Melody, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have this conversation. In terms of who I am, um, as you've said, my name is Carice Anderson. I, in terms of what I do for work, I work in HR for an asset management company, and I focus at the intersection of people managers and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's a fancy way of saying I really think about how do we support, develop, you know, our people managers and how do we hold them accountable? not only for driving high performance, but also for creating an inclusive culture and a sense of belonging for all of our employees. In terms of who I am, you know, I'm from the U.S. I was born and raised in Alabama. I'm one of three children. My parents are still married. They've been married for 52 years. Wow. And, you know, I just grew up with a very, I think, strong set of values. I've, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but I think that's definitely, you know, my upbringing shows up in who I am every day. Mm -hmm. And I love my husband. I don't have any children, but I love my husband. (laughs) (laughs) I love going to the spa. I love mangoes. I love chocolate and I love laughter. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, mangoes. Do you like chocolate covered mango? I've never had chocolate covered mango, but from having chocolate covered strawberries, I would probably say I would like it. I kind of like to keep <laughs> two separate. So. Don't spoil them. You've got to. Yeah, I, I like, I like to purist. have the wall between my fruit and my chocolate. So uh, I would probably say no. I ate some 100% uh, chocolate the other day and it was, oh, it was bitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like dark, but not. Yeah, dark. it was super yeah. dark. And then I yeah. ate some 90% after that. And it tasted really sweet. And I thought that's the way. Eat something really bitter before it. And then 90% feels like Cadbury dairy milk in comparison. It was really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, um, you mentioned there your values um, and your upbringing and your parents. And that's really the first thing that we're going to talk about is your childhood mm-hmm. and how that really um, influenced you. And like you say, still shows up today. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I come from a very close-knit family. You know, one of those families where, you know, we celebrate all holidays together and we go to church together and we do Sunday dinners. So I think that, you know, is a huge part of my value system because I think my family showed me very early on that we show up for each other and we show up for the people in our community. I think, you know, i come from a family of Christians. My father's actually a minister. You know, my grandparents were very deep in church and I went to Catholic school from kindergarten through 12th grade. So I got a lot of talk about values at home, values at school, values at church. And I think that shows up because for those of you that have ever taken Strengths Finder, one of my top five values is belief which is all about people who are strongly, you know, rooted in their values and and really bring that to an organization. So when I saw that strength, I said, what's up with, you know, who I am and how I was raised? 
And so I think, you know, that that plays a huge part in who I am. I think, you know, I think my family was very big on obviously spirituality. I come from a very musical family, you know, pretty much everybody in my family sings or my mother plays the organ and the piano. I took piano lessons for a number of years. So I think that's where my love of music comes from. It's just that I was always surrounded by it. And I think another value for me is also education. And that's one of the ones where it's kind of a bit of a flip. There's a, it's a double-edged sword. Cause on one hand, I think there was this emphasis on, okay, you have to get educated. You, you know, going to college is a non-negotiable. You're going you're, and I'm, you're going to go to grad, graduate school as well. So I think the flip side of that is there was probably an over-indexing on education where mm-hmm. you were told that's the only thing that you need mm-hmm. is your brain and these pieces of paper. And I think that's a bit of a, incomplete Mm. message because you know education is great and I believe in it but it's not the whole picture in terms of being successful I think some other themes too I would say you know I I feel like I probably grew up in a home that was kind of patriarchal I think I saw the the boys get to do things that girls couldn't do or boys Mm -hmm. were able to get the things that girls couldn't get away with (laughs) sounds familiar (laughs) And, and I think I grew up in a pretty authoritarian environment too where it's like you listen to adults and you respect people in authority and I think I took some of that into my career where I thought okay well if somebody senior tells you to do something you just do it yeah but yeah I had to realize like you know you need to bump this up against your values and you need to speak up if you don't agree with it and is there an ethical issue here that has negative consequences so I had to learn to push back I had to learn how to speak up for myself as a woman. That wasn't encouraged as a child. You, that was not something that. Yeah, I, I think you get some of those messages like, oh, you talk a little too much. You're a little too loud. And I don't necessarily know if I saw boys get those same messages. Mm-hmm. You know, I think women were supposed to be a little bit more demure. Yeah. A little bit more submissive. Yeah. And I had to learn that, you know, it's you can't make a career out of just solely being a team player and going along to get along with everybody else Mm. and what they want you have to strike the right balance between sometimes being that team player but then on the other hand saying no yeah and saying I don't think this is the right move for me or this isn't the right project for me right now it's it's super important and then I think like I said on the education front just realizing you need other people to be successful you cannot do it by yourself I don't care how smart you are and how many amazing pieces of paper you have (laughs) from all these wonderful institutions you need other people in order to reach the level of success and impact that you truly want to have well we're tribal and social animals aren't we and and in you know going way back to when we were living uh in tribes you know you literally couldn't survive on your own um and so we're wired that way and and it's no different now we still need to rely on each other and and do things together and be able to work together. Absolutely. I think, you know, what it is though, some of it is, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm American. For those of you that are just listening, I'm also black. I think sometimes, you know, when black people looked at the success of white people, we thought, okay, well, they don't want us going to their school. So that must be the answer. Mm -hmm. So I think we lost some of that tribal understanding you know, just because we were on the outside looking in. And I think when you're marginalized, you have to, you're, you're making up the rules. Nobody's telling you what they actually are. And so, you know, making assumptions about what it takes to be successful. And I also think, you know, in a lot of, I'll speak specifically for corporate spaces, because that's what I've mostly worked in. I think, you know, people, marginalized folks like me have been overlooked. And so you don't have a lot of trust in other people. You don't trust that system. Mm. And so you get in your mind, like, I'm just going to have to do it by myself because I can't trust the people and I can't trust the system. And so I think we get that, that tribal element that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's like you it was a different tribe and you weren't able to see what the rules were in the other one. I read a really great, yeah. there's a really great paper that was written, um, some research that was done here in the UK, looking at the UK civil service, looking at social mobility. Um, and one thing that came out really strongly in that research paper was people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds not understanding the unwritten rules 
of how mm. to progress. So same as you were saying, you know, you know, my work should speak for itself, go and get some more badges, some more education. But actually, there was all sorts of other stuff going on that yeah. they just didn't know about. Um, as that was actually having the impact. And part of that was people moving around and going and working in these specific roles and positions that then were a springboard to future success. So yeah, it's it's that unwritten rules is really, really mm. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because people get tripped, you get tripped up and you get, you're getting evaluated on those and you don't even know. Yes. You, you're in a game that you don't even know what the rules are. Yes, that would be like me playing chess. <laughs> me too i don't know how to play chess either. i've been watching the queen's gambit and i'm just like i don't know what what they're doing i don't understand um one thing i think is really interesting from from a british perspective you know um uh you and i both worked for a, an american firm so i have have some uh understanding of of the world of uh corporate america but um religion and attitudes to religion, I think, in the US are very different mm. to here in the UK. There's far more people in the US who would, you know, on the census say that they are Christian or have a religion mm. uh, compared, to, compared to here in the UK. And I'm, I'm interested how that played out and has influenced you. I mean, some of it goes back to what I was just talking about. I think when I think about the people that I come from and what you know, we've endured, you know, I'm a descendant of slaves and, you know, my parents survived segregation. My grandparents survived segregation. And I think, you know, when you, when you come to the U S you know, under the circumstances under which we came and you don't have anything, I mean, you literally have nothing and you're stripped of your culture and your heritage and your languages. You know, I think folks leaned on God. I think people leaned on spirituality to be able to make it through basically, you know, domestic terrorism. And so I think that's why, especially in the South amongst Black Americans, I think religion is something that's held, you know, very close to the, to the heart because of what we've experienced and we see from which we have come, you know, and, and, and I think in a lot of our minds, it's like, there's no way to explain that other than than a higher power. There's no other way to explain that than God. How could we have managed to survive all of that? You know, you think about the passage even from the West Coast of Africa to America, so many, so many folks died on that passage, like they didn't even make it. So the fact that I'm sitting here with you, I feel like I'm a miracle mm. simply because of that story. You think about all the things my ancestors had to survive you know, my great grandparents and grandparents and parents had to survive in order for me to be sitting here as a well-educated person, you know, who works, you know, in a, in a corporate who's successful and financially well off. Like it's literally, it's a miracle. And you feel like it's just, it has to be something much bigger that would have allowed me to be sitting in this position. And I think that's, that that's why the spirituality, I think, especially amongst black Americans is so strong. Mm. And do you feel, you know, how does that play out in your life, in your corporate life? Does it play out there? Do you know, it's obviously something that comes from your childhood, but, you know, what's what's the sort of echoes of that in, in today? I think for me personally, like if I look at my family, I come from a family of teachers, social workers and ministers. So I come from, you know, a group of people who devoted their lives to giving back to other people. And I think, I, I don't think it's, you know, a coincidence that I've chosen to work in HR in a corporate, because I think that is the, you know, part of organizations that really does a lot of the, the giving and the taking care of people and making sure people have what they need to be successful. So I definitely don't think that, that, that that's a coincidence. I think, you know, and for me personally, I've spent a lot of time mentoring younger people. So even individually, I try to give back and try because I know other people have done that for me in order for me to be where I'm sitting. So, you know, there's very much a pay it forward mindset that I think shows up because of, because of my upbringing mm -hmm. and, and, and my values and, and my Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and that links to the book that you wrote, but let's come to that later, I think, because it seems like a theme that's running through is this kind of lifting others up. 
um, as part of your values, your value system. Let's move on to, um, you went to Harvard Business School, very fancy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tell me a bit about that. What did you get from that? What was, uh, you know, what did you learn? What, what did that experience give you? That, you know, as oftentimes at HBS, they say that this is a transformational experience. And I know that sounds quite hokey, but I think for me, it actually was. When I think about where I come from, you know, like I mentioned, I'm from a, a small town in Alabama. And, you know, most people I know went to schools in the state, maybe the state over, maybe the state, you know, above, but never really ventured outside mm -hmm. of that part of the country. And so the fact that I even applied for me was a huge step, right? Because I think I'm, I think historically I'd been the kind of person that it's like, oh, I won't take that risk or no, I don't think they'd let me in anyway. So there's no point. I, I, I think I had a very, you know, limiting belief mindset. And so the fact that I even applied and said, I'm just going to go, you know, no safety schools. I'm going to apply to schools that I really want to go to. And I, if I don't get in, I just won't go. And so getting into HBS for me was huge, I think. And, and also I think for people around me, because it's like, I'm telling you, if I can do it, you can do it. I'm from the same place as you. I'm from, I have the same background as you, so you can do this as well. And I think, you know, actually landing there, you're just around so many brilliant people and just the conversations you have. I don't know, you know, if you ever get to spend that much time talking about real topics with such a diverse group of people from all over the world who are working in all different kinds of fields and functions and industries, and they're from different countries. I think it's just a really unique experience. I would say, you know, I traveled a lot when I was there. They, at HBS, they have these trips called tricks that are organized by people who are from those countries. And so I went, while I was there, I went to India, Morocco, Japan, Turkey, with my classmates who organized these trips. And so I just got a chance to travel around the world. And that was really eye-opening for me because I think up until I'd gone to business school, I'd only been to two places, which is the UK and I'd been to France. And so just to go to, you know, countries that were super different than where I was from was just really eye-opening. And then I would say the third part is I did meet my husband there too. So I got a lot out of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good, good ROI there. <laughs> hey, you know, so I got the piece of paper. I got a man and I, like my mind was expanded as well. So lots of good things came out of HBS. I think there's something interesting as well about going to other countries with people who are from that country. It's very different to just going as a tourist. You know, you I'm sure you saw some something more of the real place rather than the, the tourist traps yeah yeah absolutely and I think you know they want to obviously show the best of their country but I felt like we got a little bit of everything on the in those experiences so it was it was fantastic I wouldn't trade it for the world mm. and of course one of the things that we always talk about about becoming more inclusive um, is travel is such an important aspect of that and actually going and spending time in different countries and understanding different ways of doing yeah. things absolutely absolutely it, it opens your mind up so much I think especially for Americans more so than anybody because I think we're so Americentric mm -hmm. we know so little about the rest of the world where the rest of the world knows a fair amount about us and they keep up with our news and we don't do that. And so I think it's uber important for us, especially as, you know, such a rich and powerful nation to experience other places and learn that, hey, you know, America is a country like anywhere else. It's got its good points. It's got its not so good points. And thinking about, you know, what are the things that we could bring from other places that could help make our country better? Mm. And, and what about even applying for HBS? I mean, that's a pretty uh ballsy move you know it's a confident move what what made you do it what made you believe you could get in you know a lot of people just wouldn't even try yeah absolutely I think my my ingoing you know career focus for business when I was applying to business schools I wanted to work in the nonprofit, and I know people might be thinking that's an expensive place to go to go work <laughs> for an 
<laughs> I was 26, guys. I hadn't thought this thing all the way through. But when I started looking at the rankings of what were the best business schools to go to if you wanted to work in the social sector, HBS was, was probably number one at that time. So I thought, okay, let me give it a shot. And I, I wasn't really sold on it until I actually visited the campus. And then I, I went for a weekend. I think it was Prospective Students Day. And I, once I was on the campus and was meeting students and meeting faculty, I thought, oh, wow, this place is special. There's something really, really special about this place. And that's what, you know, I said, I really want to go here. And I thought, you know what, HBS, they need people. I'm a person. So why not me? You know, and I thought, and I'd say this even in my book, that we need to stop self-selecting out of different opportunities. Let somebody else tell you no. You just need to, whether it's apply for the university, the job, you know, you're on a dating app, tell that person you like them and see what happens. Let them tell you no before you assume like, oh, they won't like me <laughs> or they won't, they won't hire me for this job or they won't accept me into this school. So I am very much about, I just shoot my shot. I'm like, I'll let somebody else tell me no. And, that, and that's the approach that I took applying to business mm -hmm. school. And where were your family and all of that? Were they saying, yeah, go for it? What was their point of view? I, I'm trying to think, you know, did I even tell my parents too much about the process? I think because at the time I was working, you know, I was working at a consulting firm and, you know, you're doing you're doing all the things, right? You're taking the GMAT and you're working on your essays and you're managing the recommendation letters from the people who are going to write those. So. I don't know how much they actually knew. I mean, I, I feel like my parents were surprised when I actually got in. <laughs> I think that was a shock because like I said, it's just so out of the, the norm for most people we know and, and where we come from. And so I think it was just, I think they were like, wow, okay, you actually did this thing. And I will be honest, Melody, when I, when I found out that I got in, I remember calling my sister and I said, oh, my gosh, I, I guess I actually have to go. She's like, oh, yeah, you definitely have to go. <laughs> you know, like sometimes you, you pray for this thing and you you get everybody else to pray for the thing. And, and then the thing happens. and You're like, it's like a wake up call. Like, oh, I guess I really have to quit my job and, and move to Boston and go back to school. You know, it's a little bit daunting, but I'm very much about like pushing through fear mm. and pushing discomfort because on the other side of it so many amazing opportunities like I said met people I never would have met had conversations I never would have had I think I don't if I hadn't gone to HBS I don't think I would have met my husband so I think all of these really fantastic opportunities came out of it mm -hmm. and if I hadn't been willing to move past the discomfort mm -hmm. then I would not have benefited from all those experiences mm -hmm. Just feel the fear and do it anyway. Do it anyway. Sure. I promise you. Sure. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> so your husband is the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, so nicely led into that. So you've been married for 13 years. Is that right? Yeah, it'll be 13 years in October. Mm -hmm. So you, you told me that, you know, he's someone you've learned a lot from being around him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think. My husband, anybody that meets him, you, you know, anybody that's listening to this that has ever met for God, well, he's like one of the most authentic people you will ever meet. And that for me, I think, has just been really helpful and, and inspiring in a lot of ways. Because I think, you know, as a woman, I think as a, as a Black woman, you know, there's so many stereotypes out here about us. And so you're constantly trying to not be that and not fall into that. You know, I think tack on to that, my Southern Christian upbringing, mm. you know, you're so worried about what other people think and how are people going to receive what you're saying? And he's very much not concerned about that. <laughs> he's like, he's like, if you ask him a question, he's going to be honest and he's okay with the fact that people may not like it. And that for me has been really refreshing, you know, to know that it's like somebody told me one time, everybody's not your customer, you know? Um, so when you try to appeal to all these different people, you sometimes water yourself down. And on top of that, I don't think you're really appealing to the people who would love you just as you are, mm -hmm. who would love whatever product or service that you're selling, you know, because you're, you're shape-shifting 
to get all these different kinds of people to like you. And so that's been, that's been, really, you know, and some of that I think is also, like I was saying, I think the way we're socialized, girls are socialized versus boys. You know, I think boys don't get all these messages about who they should be and how they should be and got to worry about what other people think. Like they're just out here living their lives. And so I've adopted a lot of that, maybe even to my husband's dismay. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I wish I hadn't taught you well. <laughs> like, you're a little too real. <laughs> like, well, I learned it from you. <laughs> I learned it from the best. <laughs> exactly. So, but yeah, that's been, I, I feel like that's, and, and he even said it to me. He's like, I feel like you've grown so much and you're just so much more honest about who you are and what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And, and he asked me, I, what do you? What do you attribute that to? And I said, well, someone can I attribute to you. He's like, yeah, I thought so, but I just wanted to say I just it. wanted it to come from you. That's so funny. He's so <laughs> fishing for compliments. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to lead the witness over there, Melody. <laughs> but I, I think I would totally attribute some of it to you. I think I attribute some of it to my relationship with God. I think knowing who I am, my identity, who I, you know, whose I am, and that, you know, he has a great plan for my life. I think that also frees you up from some of the, you know, the opinions of other people, you know, because I think sometimes when we put our hands, we put our fate in the hands of other people, it's like, oh, I don't want to upset this person. And, but then you realize like, you know, whoever God has in place to bring me to my destiny, it may not be those people who don't like me, mm. but there are plenty of other people that he can use, you know what I mean? Um, to be able to, to bring me where I'm supposed to be. And then I, I would say, so my husband, I definitely think my, my relationship with God, but also I would say a third part is living in South Africa. I definitely think that was a huge confidence boost. You know, I mean, I, I often say, um, you know, in America, we have universities, we call them HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, you know, that were started because, you know, black people couldn't go to predominantly white institutions. And people who oftentimes go to HBCUs will talk about the confidence that was built being in that environment where the students are black and the professors are black and the administrators are black. And I felt like I got that same or a similar experience living in South Africa for 10 years. There's just a confidence that you get when you look around and everybody reflects you. And I think that's why representation is so important. So did you move that straight after um, being at Harvard? Did you go to South Africa straight after? No, I lived in Atlanta for five years after business school mm -hmm. and then I moved to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And what, why did you move to South Africa? What caused that move? Melody, I wish I could tell you that it was for a philanthropic you know, you went to save endeavor. the world. <laughs> save the world. I went there for a man, Millie. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done that. <laughs> no, <laughs> probably not all of us, but my, I certainly have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my husband was living there. So we we got married in 2010 and then I moved to South Africa in 2011. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what took me to South Africa. Okay. And just before we get to that, because I'm curious around that, you know, you went to Harvard to the business school because you wanted to work in the social sector that's not where you're working mm -hmm. now did you after right. after going I to did that? so after business I graduated in 2006 and I went to work in consulting for two years mm -hmm. and then I went to work in the social sector I worked for a public school district for a little over three years and I really you know I loved it and but at, at around the last year I was there I got married and my husband was living in South Africa and I was living in Atlanta and I thought, oh, this is stupid. Somebody needs to move. So I decided to be the one to move because I thought I didn't want to look back and wonder what if, if I had had that experience. So I thought, you know, my husband's American. He's obviously lived here. I had not had that experience of living out of the country. So I thought I'm going to, I'm going to pack up and move. So that, mm -hmm. that was how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. And tell me about that experience where you're living in a predominantly black environment. You know, I mean, the political, you know, it's it's in, it's a really interesting uh, yeah. representation of of uh, black society, isn't it? With all of apartheid mm. and everything that has yeah. that has been there. So I'm curious as to your experience. 
Yeah, I mean, I think living in South Africa is one of the best decisions I ever made. I kind of rated in my, my top four decisions I've ever made. I think it goes back to what we were talking about a second ago. I think just the experience of living somewhere else and seeing how other places operate and how people do things differently uh, is really, you know, it's just eye-opening. I think as a, as a Black American to live in Africa, you know, to really understand, to see, you know, those are cultural practices and traditions and to hear people speak their languages, you know, because as a Black American, we don't really necessarily have that direct tie back to Africa. Genetically, we do, but not really culturally. And so for me, it's just wonderful to see, oh, this is how Black South Africans do weddings. It's not, you know, it's not a Western wedding because you can think like, oh, everybody does the white dress and they do do that but they also have traditional garb that they wear for weddings. So to see like, you know, people's traditions and, you know, Fungai, my husband is Zimbabwean. And so when we go to the rural area in Zimbabwe, we can see like where all of his ancestors are buried and they know all these stories. They, they just have this connection that I didn't necessarily have. And so I think it's just nice to see where we, where people come from and for the, and to see that other people have that, tie back to the past, I think was really important. And I think, you know, like I said, being part of the majority, I remember one time I was at a breakfast that was being sponsored by one of the big banks in South Africa. And I looked around the room and I said, why are there so many black people in here? And then I realized, oh, I'm in Africa. You know what I mean? Cause you're so, <laughs> I, had a, I had a little, I had a little brain moment right there. I was like, what? Africa. You know, like this is okay. This is the majority, I mean, you know, 90% of people in South Africa are Black. So I think just to see people who look like you reflected in movies and television and magazine ads and running big corporates and running the government, you know, it's just, there's something about that, you know, to see that reflection of yourself um, everywhere you go that just gives you a lot of confidence mm. inherently. And I, and I can see that for other people, right? I'm like, okay, I can see, you know, because you can walk into a space and feel like you belong there because there's so many other people that look just like you. Mm. And that was not necessarily an experience I'd had before moving there. No. Because especially in a corporate, you know, you I remember when I first started working, I would walk in a room and count every Black person in the room. I'd be like, <laughs> And it wouldn't and take very long. Yeah. exactly that's why I stopped doing it because I was like okay here is this is a pointless exercise but yeah you just you you just get used to the fact of the faces that you look at every day do not look like yours mm. and so it was really nice to have that experience for those you know 10 years that I lived in South Africa you told me as well around uh your feeling towards the law enforcement towards the police was very different as well yeah yeah absolutely I think you know, a lot of a lot of police brutality on Black people happened while I was living in South Africa. You know, Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner and Sandra Bland, all these, all these Black people, you know, were killed by police, basically, um, while I was in South Africa. And, you know, just to juxtapose that the experience that I know Black Americans were having in America versus me in South Africa, because all the cops are Black, and, and at least in the area I lived, I lived in Johannesburg. And, you know, I, I, you get stopped by police all the time there. They do a lot of roadblocks in wealthier neighborhoods. And so you're, you're stopped all the time. And I never was afraid. And I never felt like I need to have a protocol. You know, I need to say, oh, I got to put my hand, I'm putting my hands on the, on the wheel. And I'm reaching for my seatbelt, you know, because you don't want people to think you're making any sort of sudden moves so they don't panic and, and shoot you. I never had any of that fear in South Africa. I remember, you know, a lot of a lot of women in South Africa, we put our purses in the trunk. They call it the boot there. And, you know, I could stop by police and they'd be like, oh, we want to see your license. I'd say, oh, my purse is in the trunk. I'd hop out, you know, grab the purse, pull out my license. You know, we'd chat for a second and then it would be over. Like, I never had any sort of fear. And I thought, wow, I feel safer interacting with police in another country than I do in my own. What was the reason for having the person, we say boot too, so what, what was the purpose of the, the um, uh, in, in the trunk? Why did you keep it there? Yeah, there's a lot of smash and grab 
robberies in South Africa. So people will, you know, see your purse on that front seat, they'll smash your window and steal it. And so to avoid that, mm-hmm. you put it in the, you put it in the boot or the trunk. So that's, that's why I would have it in the trunk. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and I think there's always been this tension b- between law enforcement and, and especially I think in poor black communities. So I know it's not a new thing, but I think it's the visual of it. What we, you know, seeing all these videos, you know, George Floyd, seeing all these things happen, it definitely, you know, takes a mental toll and makes you rethink those interactions in a way that maybe you didn't before you saw those videos. Then going back to the US, did you have to reacclimatize? Like, what was that like where you'd been, you know, you'd been not the majority, mm. you'd been in the majority for 10 years and then you went back? What was that like? It's a good question. I mean, I think. I knew because I'd lived here for so long before and spent, you know, a good part of my career here. I I knew what that meant. But, you know, I mean, I will say, you know, when I see police drive by, I do get a little bit like, you know, you get a little bit of a little bit of trepidation, a little bit of fear. Um, I think in terms of the corporate space, I'm still figuring it out. Right. And this is something I've said to people that are like me who, you know, are Americans, Black Americans that lived in South Africa. It's funny in South Africa, your Americanness trumps your blackness in the sense that people see you as American first and black second. And I mean, you know, up until a certain point in South Africa, I mean, I think the perception of America has changed a little bit um, with some of the, just the political climate here. But, you know, when I first moved there, people would say, well, why would you have left there to come here? You know, and I think, when people would first see me, they would think that I was Black South African and they would treat me one way. And then as soon as I opened my mouth and they realized I'm American, they're like, oh, who is this? And there there was this like heightened sense of interest (laughs) in me. And so I think some of that also spilled over into, you know, the corporate work I did. I definitely think people may have treated me better or differently than a Black South African because I'm Black American. And so I realized... I don't have that privilege here anymore. And so I kind of have to recalibrate, you know, how I show up because the things that come out of this face land differently with people than if it came out of another, Mm -hmm. you know, like a white man's face. I think sometimes the things that I might say might come across as, you know, more political or there's just a different tone to it because also a lot of people are not used to working with people who look like me if you've been in a firm and it's very majority white it's when you know when you have to interact with somebody who looks like me it feels quite different and mess things that I say land a little bit differently than somebody else who says it so I think you know I'm still trying to figure all that out I'm still trying to navigate that but it's it's uh-huh. definitely a real thing Sure. And would you think describe the the corporate culture in South Africa is it very different to America? I think you know because South Africa is a very relational, relationship oriented, community based type of place. I think that comes across in how people interact. You know, you don't you would never jump into a call and start talking about business uh-huh. straight away. You got to spend the first five minutes. How was your weekend? And how was your, how's your family? And how are you? You know, so I think, and I mean, that concept, it, you know, applies everywhere in South Africa in that sense. They call it, they call it Ubuntu. It's a Zulu word. It means, it basically means I am because we are. And so our humanity is connected. And so when I go into the grocery store, I can't just walk up to the checkout person and say, well, Al is the toothpaste on. I need to ask her, how are you? And then she'll ask me how I am. And then we can launch into, you know, whatever my inquiry is. But, and I think that whole acknowledging each other's humanity also shows up in work, you know? And I think, you know, obviously I think Africa has a different idea Mm -hmm. about time as well, you know? So I think that there's also some of that. And I think also it probably is slightly different. I think, you know, because most South African cultures are very, hierarchical and so people bring that into work too so people sometimes might find it difficult to challenge somebody in authority or to push back 
on somebody who's higher on the org chart than you. So I think, you know, some of those cultural elements do lead over into a corporate space as well. I'm going to move us on, if that's all right, um, to um, you mentioned to me before that you're, the, you're sort of a first generation corporate employee. So say a bit about that, what that's meant for you, for your family. Because, you know, a lot of times I think people will talk about, oh, you're the first person in your family to go to college. Well, that was that was not my circumstances. My grandmother actually has a master had a master's degree. And so I, I'm really a third generation college graduate, but first generation corporate employee. And I think for me, when I look back on it, I think I just had no clue about the world I was stepping uh-huh. into. And I had no one around me who could pull me to the side and say, hey, here's some things you might want to think about as you step into that space. I literally walked into it as if I was, I don't know, going to like, what would be the grade? So technically, I guess it would be like, I act like I was going to the 17th grade, right? Like I'd done 12 years of high school, four years of college. And now it's just like, oh, I'm going to the next grade. <laughs> I, I didn't look at it like, no, Kerry, this is a different world. There's a different set of rules here. There's a different set of success principles here that you don't know anything about, uh, but that are critical to you being able to have the kind of impact that you want to have. And, you know, so that's what I think about a lot of companies, you know, when we're doing DEI programs, you know, you're, you're not acknowledging that people are coming from different starting points. Even if you look on the CV and say, oh, she went to university, she went to Harvard Business School. It's like, my path to Harvard Business School was not the same as someone else's. And even my experience while I was there could have been very, very different in terms of the networking I was able to do and relationships I was able to build because I am underrepresented in that space. And so I think we just need to do more of meeting people where they're at and acknowledging what that starting point is because my distance to the finish line might be much longer than yours. And I might need different things than somebody else needs because I haven't had that exposure. Yeah. You know, cause I've, I was talking to some people and, that work in asset management and you know, they were talking about, yeah, my dad was on the investment committee at his job or my, or my mom worked in finance. And so the, they, they knew of a whole world I, that I didn't even know existed. And they heard words, you know, being used in their homes that I had no clue about. And so they would automatically have a leg up in that space. Mm. I, think it's, I think it's hugely underestimated the power of that. The power Absolutely. of understanding how the corporate world works, not just from, I mean, we hear a lot about, you know, people getting internships or, you know, the network mm-hmm. helping you get a job. And of course, there's all of those benefits. But there's, for me, there's something around just understanding the unwritten rules, the here, you know, what you need to focus on, how, you know, just, there's just a whole world out there of understanding Absolutely. that many of us didn't get because mm-hmm. our parents weren't in that world. Absolutely. And I think the thing that corporates have to really think about is we're judging people based on rules that they don't even know exist. So, and I'm going to paraphrase someone that I interviewed for my book. Um, her name is Kahiso. She said a lot of times Black professionals don't know how to navigate these spaces and it comes across as laziness or unprofessionalism Mm -hmm. when it's just people don't know what they're supposed to be doing or how they're supposed to be showing up or that they're even being evaluated on these things and so I I just you know try to advise people to release some of your your speedy judgments about people because I think what it also turns into well this person is disengaged or they don't care they're not invested you know for example when I was bringing up the you know, in, in South African culture, you don't challenge people in authority. But I worked at a management consulting firm when I was in South Africa, and it, that place is all about challenging authority mm-hmm. and pushing back and interrupting people so that you can get your point across. That is the antithesis of South African culture. Mm. So you're asking people to be raised in a culture from birth until they're pretty much 22 years old to not challenge authority, and then you expect them to flip a switch 
come into your environment and be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but you're going to be, you're going to make a judgment about them if they don't. Yeah. So you're going to say you're you're disengaged or you don't have anything to contribute or you're, you don't care or you're not interested. And it's like, no, there's things underneath. It's like that iceberg, you know, all you're seeing is the 10% of the iceberg, but you're not understanding what's below the line that could be impacting the 10%. And helping me address some of that as opposed to solely judging me on the 10% exactly. of the iceberg. It's like you don't know what you don't know. Um, you don't even know that you need to know it because you don't even know it exists. Absolutely. And, and I had a colleague say to me, he said, how can you help me if you don't know me? Mm. You know, I can't look at you and, and say, well, this is what Melody needs. It's like, I actually have to talk to you. I've got to understand where you're coming from, mm-hmm. what your mindset is what you've been exposed to, what your background has been for me to say, okay, if this is the finish point. If this is the you know finish line and Melody's all the way back here, what are the things I need to give her mm-hmm. in order to give her the best shot at making it there? And for me, it's not about giving you an, an, um, an advantage. It's literally about leveling the yeah. playing field. So you have the yeah. likelihood of making it to the finish line that somebody else does who's starting you know five meters ahead of yeah. you. And they also are unaware that they're five meters ahead. I think that's what's interesting is you oh, know, people absolutely. are, um, and we talk about, you know, privilege and it's, a, um, you know, it can be a very um, triggering word for a lot of people, but it's um, it's really interesting to, to try and understand, you know, what mm, I as yeah. a white middle-class person, the privilege I had compared mm. to other people. Mm-hmm. And it's difficult. I yeah, think. and for those, And for those that are listening who might be triggered by even the fact that we're talking about privilege, I mean, think about it. Privilege is basically what are the elements of who you are that have not made your life more difficult? I will say for myself, you know, I've talked about being Black, but I'm also somebody who doesn't have a visible or invisible disability. Mm -hmm. That has Mm -hmm. not made my life harder. When I go to a building, I don't have to think about how I'm going to get inside of it or how I'm going to navigate it because it was designed for people just like me. So, you know, I often say to people, if you think about the landscape of your life now or as you were growing up, who were miss, Who were the people that were missing from that landscape? Those are the people you know the least about and the ones you need to listen to the most because you just have no idea what their struggles are or what their challenges are and thus you don't know what it is that they need in order to be successful or what their starting point is, you know, that you need to provide resources to help them get to that finish line. You ha- I think we have to spend more time talking to each other and understanding each other. And that led you on, I guess, you know, we said there's this thread of, of raising people up that, that runs through mm-hmm. um, your life. But, you know, your experience of struggling to understand the corporate world, because you were the first from your family in that, led you to write your book. Is that right? Or is one yes. of the reasons? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was probably... Yeah, it was probably the number one reason that made me write my book is I thought I've had the privilege of working in several high performing corporates. And the thing about a high performing corporate is that what I think is different about them is that they skim the cream off the top of everywhere and bring all those people together. Mm -hmm. So you're in an environment where everybody's smart. Everybody was top of class and full scholarship and valedictorian and salutatorian and so it's not enough to just be smart there are other things that you have to do to be able to stand out and that's you know I really that's why I wrote my book and I wanted you know I often say it's kind of it's the three e's that's that's why I wrote the book I say the first e is empowerment I wanted people to know you know these systems have some you know work to do there's some broken pieces of some of these systems in which we're operating but there are so many things that you have complete control over and you have complete control over yourself and how you show up and the relationships you build. And so it was, it was the empowerment element. It was the examination. I wanted people to look at what are the messages you've gotten growing up and how might those be impacting how you show up? And, you know, are we, I think we're smart enough to be fluid. You know, we can operate in one culture at home and operate in a different culture at work. And so helping people think about that. And then I think the other, the third E was just exposure. I wrote my book because I wanted to expose people to the, you know, fantastic global network that I have. And so I interviewed, you know, 30 people and their quotes are sprinkled throughout the book. So 
that those are really the reasons I, I wanted to write the book, but it was all sort of rooted in, I saw a lot of folks who were brilliant, but had no clue where they had come to. And I thought, well, I can tell you some of these things because I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made in 1998. Mm. I want you to make new mistakes. Because <laughs> those old mistakes, yeah, I want you to make new ones. I can't save you from making all mistakes because you're still a human, but I can help you make, I can help you not make the ones I made in 1998. And that was the whole impetus behind writing the book. Mm -hmm. And the title is? Intelligence Isn't Enough, A Black Professional's Guide to Thriving in the Workplace. Yeah. Um, and I, and you know, part of it, because I did, I was living in South Africa when I wrote the book. I had a black professional in mind because obviously, you know, 90% of people are black there. And so I think I was speaking, and I also because I'm black and I know some of the cultural messaging that we get that doesn't always serve us in a corporate space. I mean, like I was saying earlier about a certain level of mistrust. I mean, I've spoken to Black audiences all over, you know, in, in EMEA, in, you know, Europe, in Africa, in America. And one piece of advice that a lot of us get is the put your head down, work hard, and, you know, go home, and you'll be tapped on the shoulder as the chosen one. The other piece of advice is don't tell those people at your work, at your job, your business. They're not your friends. You didn't go there to make friends. If you tell them your business, they're going to use it against you. So I some of those messages make us show up in a certain way that doesn't help us. It doesn't help us be successful in those spaces. Because like you said, it's very tribal. It's very relational, you know? Um, and so again, people to sort of unpack that and figure out what are some of the things that have happened to you, the messages you've gotten, and are those, are those serving you in terms of the impact that you want to have? in in your career and you obviously wrote it with a certain audience in mind it's aimed at you know yes. young black yes. professionals I guess as your your target audience but I think for me it's there's two other audiences where it's super helpful one is people like me who uh, want to understand and work in the diversity and inclusion space and and to understand um, that perspective but actually I think many minority groups will be experiencing oh, something similar, maybe asking themselves the same questions will uh, provide some really fruitful answers for them. Absolutely. And I say that to people. I think even if you're a white professional, if you come from a family where you don't have a network of other corporate professionals, you will get a lot out of my book too. Because, you know, I didn't work for a majority black multinationals. I worked for majority white multinationals. So the advice I'm sharing is very relevant if you're working in those spaces and you don't have people in your network who can who can sort of hip you to the game. Mm. It's really interesting we talk about talk about network. It's one of the things that's come up so often on this podcast mm -hmm. is the importance of people's network. Um right. and uh and again it's one of those things that I think you don't realize. You don't know how quite how important that network is. Um until yeah. You yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because that's why I feel like, you know, a lot of times we will see people who are not as intellectually gifted as us advance faster mm -hmm. than us. And we look at them like, I've worked with that person. He's not that great. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but he's got the right relationships and he's got people that are in that decision making room that are advocating for him. And, and, you know, you, advocate for people that you have that connection with so it's like if I got to choose between you and somebody that I don't know I'm probably gonna choose yeah. my friend I think it's just nature. yeah and I think I underestimated for a really long time in my career how much people were advocating for each other mm. and the power of having a, a manager for instance who advocated for you versus one who, who yeah. didn't was it immense in terms of career progression opportunities etc so you know mm -hmm. it's it, you know we talk about sponsors but actually advocates is one step further it's someone who's saying good things about you and putting you forward for things and suggesting you for things absolutely it's really important mm -hmm. i'm curious yeah. to know where next for you what's what's on your horizon is there another book in there what's what's your next step I, I have a notes app, Melody, that is full of book ideas. Oh. So I, I'm sure my, this book was re-released with a new publisher, Barrett Kohler, in, in October of last year. So I'm still trying to 
market that book uh, and hopefully will give the publisher enough proof that I can sell that book so that they would give me the resources to, to write another one. But I definitely have other ideas. Um, I would love to potentially do like an online course for my book to, you know, because my book is full of a lot of tips and advice, but I would love to walk people through the journey of actually implementing, you know, pick two or three things from the book and let's put those into practice and let me help coach you through that. So I would love to do something like that as well. I love to think about doing a podcast. I, I love podcasts. It's the best. So <laughs> it's the best. I heartily recommend it. <laughs> I love the idea of doing a podcast as well. So I've got a whole bunch of ideas in terms of what could potentially be next for me. But, but you know, at the end of the day, it's all about just paying it forward, mm-hmm. you know, and, and helping people have a faster trajectory to where they want to be. Mm, fantastic. So, um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I ask all of my guests. Uh, one is some advice for your younger self. I will say three things. I will say, first of all, spend a lot of time understanding who you are. I just, yeah, and I, I could ultimately, you know, go back to the framework for my book, which is know yourself, know others, and know your environment. So, you know, the knowing self part is understanding what has transpired over the course of your life up until this moment. How have you made decisions? What emotional triggers do you have? What are your strengths, your areas of development? What's your, you know, passions are? What do you think your purpose could be? I think it's just spending time, you know, blocking out the noise of the people around you and what they want for you and really understanding who you are, I think is is my number one. I think on the knowing others front, you know, just realizing that success success requires collaboration and inclusion. You cannot do this by yourself. And any successful person will tell you the list of people who played a role in their success. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there is, you know, anybody that's done anything of note, they've done it in conjunction with collaboration with other people. So really, I think if you have that mindset, thinking about how can I work with people who are different than me? How can I, you know, not just take, but also give, you know, I think it, to make those relationships mutually beneficial and long lasting. And then I would say the third one is just taking ownership, you know, take ownership of your career, your brand, your development, your mindset, your relationships, you know, because um, one of the things I say in my book is, you know, you're an employee, but you're the CEO of you incorporated. <laughs> and no CEO sits around waiting for answers, waiting for somebody to come and tell them. They go out and seek the answers. They seek the resources. So just taking ownership, I think, of your career is super, super important um, because nobody's ever going to care as much about it as you no. do. No, fantastic. Thank you. A final question is around a strap line or a title for your your story. I would say, I'd say unlocking your greatness. I really think there's greatness in all of us. And it's just a matter of us spending the time, the energy, the resources, figuring out what is the greatness within you that you have to offer to the world. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. I really, really enjoyed it. So nice to catch up as well, just to see your smiley face and to hear how you're doing and everything. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Melody. It's been it's been great catching up and sharing these sharing these stories and having this conversation. I feel like we covered so much ground in that conversation. It was wide ranging and such a a pleasure and a privilege to get a glimpse into somebody else's life about her experience of being black in, in America, but also how that was different when she lived in South Africa and the confidence that uh, she gained from living in a predominantly black environment also really found fascinating was the conversation around religion and her relationship with God um, and how that influences her and her life and her decisions and how she feels about things. And the, the final piece that I thought was fascinating and really relates to her book 
um, which is a fabulous read and I will include in the show notes a link to it. Um, it's this idea that we're judging people on rules that they don't even know exist and what can we as organisations and people who advise organisations do to make those unwritten rules more explicit so that we are creating a fairer, more equitable playing field for everybody. This podcast is brought to you by Liberare Consulting with editing provided by Hawkins Social. If you enjoyed today's episode, why not click on the subscribe button so you are the first to hear about new episodes. We look forward to welcoming you back soon.